Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. Just a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed a distinguished and respected journalist and author who said that voter suppression to him was like the Loch Ness Monster. A lot of people talked about it, but no one had ever really seen it. I tell this story because I'm afraid that his attitude is far too prevalent and his confusion between voter fraud and voter suppression all too common. While widespread voter fraud may be a fragment of Chris Kobach and Donald Trump's imagination, it should never be conflated with voter suppression, which is very real, anti-democratic, and infused with a degree of racism that particularly since a 2003 Supreme Court decision has become almost the regular order of things in multiple parts of the country. As we sit two months out from the midterm elections, the basic right of millions of Americans are under threat at precisely the time when the future of the country is at stake as never before. This is particularly true in states with high-profile races like Georgia and Florida, where voter suppression may truly affect the outcome. We're going to talk about this today with my guest, Carol Anderson. Carol Anderson is the Charles Howard Candler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University. She's the author of the previous best-selling book, White Rage, which also won the National Book Critics Circle Award. She was a Guggenheim Fellow for Constitutional Studies. And she's recently authored One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. Carol Anderson, thanks so much for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I want to talk first about this confusion a lot of people have about voter fraud and voter suppression, that there really are two very different things. I'm surprised that how many people confuse them. And and I think that part of the problem is that first you get, frankly, the smoke and mirrors of voter fraud. And we've heard that mantra over and over and over again, so it almost sounds like the truth. But when you go looking for it, it's just not there. It is the Loch Ness Monster. But what happens then is that um, politicians, particularly the Republicans, have used the, the language of voter fraud, the fear of voter fraud, the, the, the warning signs that our democracy is under siege and imperiled by voter fraud to then justify voter suppression and why voter suppression doesn't ping up and, and why we can't see it as readily is because the ways that um, it's implemented are very um, bureaucratic, um, very subtle, um, but very devastating. And, oh. and, and it looks and I've got to say, the other thing is that it looks um, like our system works. Um, we see polls going through. We see debates between the candidates. Um, we see people going to the polls and casting a vote. Um, we see election results on that night, and then we have a winner declared. And so we have the, the kind of illusion that the system is working. But if we look behind the curtain, we'll see the little Wizard of Oz um, pulling the, the levers, giving the appearance of something functioning, when in fact what is going on is that we have systematically, via our laws, cut out millions of people from their basic right to vote. One of the things that has contributed to this in the past few years, and you spend a great deal of time focusing on this in one person, no vote, is this Shelby decision, this Supreme Court decision from 2013. Talk about that. Yes, and so to understand Shelby, I think part of what we have to understand is that um, it came in the wake of Barack Obama's elections. One of the things that we often hear, for instance, is that, well, how racist can this nation be? We elected a black man twice to the White House, and people pat themselves on the back. Uh, but in fact, it was since 1964, the majority of whites, and 64 is key because that's when um, LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and then 65 we get the Voting Rights Act. Since then, uh, the majority of whites have not voted for a Democratic candidate for president since 1964. The coalition that put Obama in the White House, that voted Obama in the White House, is one where he brought 15 million new voters to the polls. 
primarily African American, Latino, Asian American, the youth, and those who make below $15,000 a year. That was the coalition that he brought in um, that, that put him in power. The Shelby County v. Holder decision basically gutted the Voting Rights Act. And the way that it did that was to uh, Chief, of, Chief Justice John Roberts said, you know, racism really isn't like it was in the era of Jim Crow. It's not like it was um, in the 60s or in the 1890s. Those days are over. Um, and it, this, this, this act is, is stagnant. Um, many of the jurisdictions that were placed under its domain um, in 1965 have remained there. Only 17 have bailed out. Clearly, there's something wrong with the act. And, and, this, and so this, what this act is doing, he said, is picking on the South. Now, I counter that the reason why so few have bailed out is because so few have stopped discriminating against their minority populations um, at the ballot box trying to figure out ways how to wiggle around, how to keep African-Americans and Latinos and Asian-Americans from voting. And that didn't seem to cross John Roberts or the other four, chief, or the other four justices um, in that 5-4 decision. The Voting Rights Act had provided the shield um, where states that had had a history of discriminating against this minority populations at the ballot box and states that had used a method to in, ensure a limited access to the ballot box, such as a poll tax or a literacy test. Um, those states had come under what they called the pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. So whenever they changed any of their laws uh, dealing with voting rights, um, they had to have that change okayed by the Department, U.S. Department of Justice or by the, the federal court in D.C. Without the Voting Rights Act, the protection of the Voting Rights Act, these states, boom, went for it, making all kinds of changes um, now that they didn't have to have them pre-cleared. And these changes um, were targeted at the very groups that had put Obama in the White House. Talk a little bit about what some of those specific changes are. We hear a lot about photo ID, voter ID, but there's also a whole panoply of changes. Yes, so um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll start first with voter ID because that seems to be the one where you get the, the language about voter fraud. What that one did was it sounds innocuous. This is part of why this, it seems invisible or, or not, not existent, because it sounds innocuous. All you need to do is show your ID uh, to prove who you are um, to, to vote. But it's not just any ID. These legislatures, such as the one in North Carolina, received data about what types of government-issued photo IDs African Americans had and didn't have, which were the ones that whites had um, in a preponderance vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the number of that African Americans had. And then that legislature wrote into the law to, to, to privilege the kinds of IDs that whites had. You take a place like Alabama, um, in 2011, before the um, Shelby County v. Holder decision even, um, Alabama passed a voter ID law. Uh, it, never implement, it didn't implement it at the time because they knew it couldn't get past the Department of Justice preclearance um, review. But after Shelby County v. Holder, Alabama did implement that law. That law said you must have a government-issued photo ID. It identified which types of government-issued photo ID would be um, acceptable. And it decided that um, public housing ID would not count. Now, Alabama's a poor state. 
Uh, it has a lot of people in public housing, 71% of whom are African American. Um, but so therefore to say that public housing ID does not count means that they're automatically Xing out that population from being able to access the ballot box. To double down on that, then the governor of Alabama shut down the Department of Motor Vehicles in the Black Belt counties, uh, which would require then um, residents of those counties to go about 50 miles to get an ID. But if you don't drive and there's no public transportation, how do you get 50 miles to get an ID? So that's part of the chicanery behind the photo ID, government-issued photo ID. Um, the other, one of the other things that they, they do is uh, voter roll purges. Voter roll purges um, came out of a law, um, the National uh, Voter Registration Act, which was designed to open up registration um, by saying that, you know, if you're at a Department of Motor Vehicles, you can get your voter, you can register to vote there. You don't have to go downtown to the Board of Elections, for instance. Um, because Congress was concerned that in the 1988 election, voter turnout was the lowest it had been since 1924. But the Republicans put a, a clause in there that dealt with voter roll maintenance. And again, it sounds innocuous enough. Yeah, we need to make sure that people who have died are no longer on the voting rolls. People who have moved out of the jurisdiction are no longer on the voting rolls. Again, it sounds reasonable. But what the secretaries of state have done um, is to use that language of voter roll maintenance to, to give the aura that they're doing their job, while in fact what they're doing is that they're removing millions of American citizens off of the voting rolls simply because they have not voted regularly in a federal election. And then there's gerrymandering. And what gerrymandering does, I mean, so let me back. So the census, uh, the Constitution requires that um, after the census is taken, that a legislative body um, aligns and draws the districts to deal with the population shifts that have happened over the past decade. That sounds, again, innocuous. But what the Republicans did um, was to... And we've had gerrymandering for a long time. Let me be really clear about that. They have just taken it to an extreme level. Um, they use this powerful um, computer software mapping program. They bring in the kind of Cambridge analytics data about who lives where so they can figure out what their political proclivities might be. And then they start drawing the maps to dilute the power, um, the voting power, to dilute the very instance of one person, one vote. Um, so what we had in Wisconsin, which is a case of extreme partisan gerrymandering, after the maps were drawn, Democrats, Democratic candidates for the state legislature received 52% of the vote, and they received 39% of the seats in the state legislature. And it got worse with each subsequent election so that the voting power of Democrats is absolutely diluted. And the voting power of Republicans is amplified with these extreme gerrymandered maps. And they create these safe districts so that you don't have uh, the kind of representation. Um, so, for instance, um, we were trying to figure out you know, you, uh, during um, when Congress was trying to gut the Affordable Care Act, but you're seeing 70% of Americans really want the Affordable Care Act. They want to see it improved, not gutted. But Congress was barreling down that path to, to, to dismantle um, Obamacare, access to health insurance. And it looked like this weird juxtaposition. How are you getting 70% of Americans really valuing this? And how are you getting uh, the, the majority of Republicans going against this? Mm 
And it's because of these gerrymandered districts that create these, these safe districts where they don't have to be responsive to the needs and, um, of their constituency. One of the things we've seen, though, is the courts have stepped in in some of these more egregious cases, and North Carolina and Mm -hmm. and Wisconsin perhaps being the penultimate examples here, to really deal with at least the gerrymandering part of this. The the courts have stepped in. You know, there are times when you're just like, thank God for the federal courts. Um, But frankly, what is scary and what we have to pay attention to is how... Um, the current Senate is rushing through a slate of federal judges, these justices that have been nominated by Donald Trump, onto the federal bench because McConnell had held off on moving through many of Obama's nominations for the federal bench. There were all of these holes. And now they're being filled with Trump appointees who are very clearly looking at their track record anti-voting rights. And so how long this federal uh, bulwark can hold is, is, is not clear. One of the places you mentioned where a lot of this suppression has been going on for a long time is in Alabama. And yet there was a significant black turnout in Alabama that helped elect Doug Jones. Talk a little bit about that, how it played out, and the degree to which the problem is getting better or worse there. That, as you know, that that election in Alabama um, is in my chapter called The Resistance. Because the state of Alabama deployed every method of voter suppression. You know, not only the voter IDs, um, not only the gerrymandered districts. And what we know about gerrymandering is that it's designed also to demoralize a population because you feel like your vote doesn't count because the system is rigged. Um, And so it brings about lower voter turnout. Um, But Alabama had also done voter roll purges, had also moved polling places, shut down 66 polling places. The research is clear for every um, half mile, quarter mile that a um, polling place is moved, the black voter turnout rate goes down the further away the polling place is from um, the African American community. And so uh, Alabama had shut down 66 polling places. You also had massive disfranchisement due to felony convictions. In 1901, when Alabama wrote its Jim Crow Constitution, it had a clause in there that if you have been convicted of a crime of moral turpitude, you have lost your voting rights. And if you try to vote after that, it is a felony and you can go back to prison. That was 1901. Alabama refused to define moral turpitude. And the result of that was that 8% of its population um, was disfranchised and 15% of African-American voters disfranchised. But this, and this is where I I just started doing the dance of joy. Um, Civil society stepped in and did the heavy lifting of democracy. Um, Groups like the NAACP, the Legal Defense Fund, the ACLU, the League of Women Voters started pounding on Alabama, for instance, on the moral turpitude clause, taking back to court and back to court and back to court till finally Alabama relented and in 2017 defined the, the, um, the crimes that count as moral turpitude, like murder, rape, treason. And then those organizations turned to Secretary of State John Merrill and said, great, now tell all of the folks that you told that they couldn't vote, now tell them that this new law means that they can. And John Merrill said, "Mm, I don't think that's a really good use of state resources. (laughs) So these organizations, uh, the Legal Society of Alabama, as well as the ACLU of Alabama, 
began to send out the word via radio as well as social media that if you have a felony conviction, you actually might be able to vote. Come to these restoration clinics that we've set up and let's find out. And so through a massive publicity campaign and then these restoration clinics, which were held in many in the uh, black churches, uh, you had a team of lawyers and volunteers going through people's uh, records and saying, nope, that's not moral turpitude. Nope, that's not moral turpitude. Wow, yes, you can vote. And then the next phase was to have them um, – to figure out what it, they needed to do in order to be able to register to vote and get them registered. Another group, the, um, the Ordinary People Society, went into the jails because Alabama had on the books that those who were incarcerated could vote absentee ballot. Now, of course, if you don't know whether moral turpitude – you know, counts for you or not, you're hesitant to vote. But now that it had been defined, the, the, um, the group went into the jails, also going through people's records, then registering them, getting them registered to vote, and then um, providing them with absentee ballots. Um, you had another group, uh, the NAACP did a fabulous job in terms of finding out who didn't vote in 2016 or who had been voting sporadically and began calling them, sharing that informi information with indivisible so that they were calling and then following up by knocking on doors and talking to their neighbors about what was at stake, what were the issues that, that really resonated, that meant the most uh, to the, the people who hadn't voted yet. And what was coming out, of course, access to health care, quality education, jobs with living wage, a living wage, criminal justice reform. And then the volunteers, the organizers were uh, laying out how each of those could be affected by who was going to be um, elected and then registering people to vote. They understood that voting is a, a, is a social function. Um, and so they were also going to class reunions with packets of information about how do you register to vote um, and where do you register to vote and what's the deadline for registering to vote. But one of the other pieces that I loved, there were a couple of other pieces. One was given that the polls had been closed, uh, they worked out a private car system, kind of like in the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, that m would transport voters from their homes to the polls and back because the distance to the polls was one of the key barriers to access, accessing the right to vote. Um, they also had the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights had a team of lawyers stationed in key poll, uh, polling precincts to ensure um, that the right to vote was, um, was fully, um, what do you call it, um, <clears throat> was fully adhered to. Um, so one of the things that came out, for, for example, um, was that when those who had been previously convicted went to, to vote, um, they brought their mug shots, and uh, some poll workers weren't accepting them. But it had been worked out that, in fact, mug shots were a government-issued photo ID. So being able to clarify that on the spot, right there, allowed those to um, those people to be able to vote and to really begin that full civic engagement again. I mean, it it just it 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 was a thing of beauty. What civil society did, they talked with each other, they shared information, they coordinated. You also had money pouring in from outside of Alabama, but that outside money understood that the folks in Alabama who were there on the ground knew best how to deploy and use those resources. Um, the result was uh, John Merrill believed 
that uh, the voter turnout rate in that election would be 25%. In fact, it was 40%. But in the Black Belt counties where Alabama had seriously deployed um, every voter suppression method out there, it was 45%. And that was basically the, 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 the window of victory um, to, to defeat Roy Moore. Among all of these methods that you've been talking about, one that, that we don't hear as much about, but it did come up at various times in the 2016 campaign, was this whole idea of voter intimidation. Talk about that. Mm. Yeah, and so voter intimidation is, um, and it's that's some old school Jim Crow right, right there. Uh, back in the Jim Crow days, what would happen is that uh, the sheriff would be right there at the polling place, um, and the relationship between law enforcement and the black community is not a good one, because law enforcement would use its power to to intimidate. To beat. I mean, the, the, the sheriffs used to brag about beating black people who tried to vote. That is a memory, that is a history, that is a legacy. And so voter intimidation is like what happened in the 2000 election, where um, in Florida, in Jacksonville, uh, the Florida Highway Patrol set up checkpoints. In the, into, in, at the only road going into the voting precinct at, in black neighborhoods. It, um, and so as you're coming up to go vote, all of a sudden you have to go through a checkpoint with police officers who are questioning who you are, trying to figure out if you've got a warrant, trying to, you know, just, just the kind of intimidation that means, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to deal with this. And let's face it, that was relying upon that memory, uh, relying upon that history is also then where you have Donald Trump uh, when he's in Pennsylvania talking about sending up his team to a poll watch in Philadelphia. And that is not even a dog whistle. That is a bark. <laughs> because one of the key ways of defining voter fraud is to align it with urban areas, which then becomes code for African Americans. And so saying Philadelphia is a way of saying this is where the problem is. Um, before that, you had the, the folks, True the Vote, who would go in to polls and challenge people saying, I don't believe you're supposed to be here. Uh, you're not uh, uh, um, a, a citizen or you're not, you're, not, you're not registered here on the polls, right? You know, so you're not, you're not supposed to be voting here. And that kind of harassment um, is also part and parcel of voter suppression. It's not supposed to happen, but it does. How do you see all of this playing out in the 2018 elections from what you're seeing both nationally but more specifically in some of the high-profile races that we're looking at in places like Georgia and Florida? And what I see happening um, is civil society and, in fact, many citizens are now on alert. Um, I take, for instance, the example of um, Randolph County, Georgia. What happened there was, uh, let me back up, after, what, what happened there was that uh, a consultant who was an ally of Brian Kemp, who is our Secretary of State and now the Republican um, running for governor, had recommended in Randolph County that is over 60 percent black. This is in that, Georgia for our listeners. We're talking about Georgia here. Georgia, yes. Right. Randolph County in Georgia had recommended that 60, uh, wait, back up, 60 percent, over 60 percent of Randolph County is African-American. 
he had recommended that seven of the nine polling places be shut down before the general election. Now, he used the excuse that they were not ADA compliant, but the issue of ADA compliance was not there during the primary when Brian Kemp was running, nor was it there during the GOP runoff between Brian Kemp and Casey Cagle. It, it reared its head when it became clear that Kemp was going to be running against Stacey Abrams, an African-American woman. And when you began to look at where his consultant had designated most of the polls to be closed, there were 10 counties in Georgia. Uh, those 10 counties all had sizable black populations. But civil society was watching and began spreading the word about what these recommendations were designed to do um, and how they were, they, they were designed to, to force many Randolph County residents to go 10 miles to be able to vote. And they flooded social media, they flooded traditional media, and they packed the Board of Elections meeting where that proposal was being voted upon, and they shut it down. And so it's that kind of, frankly, eternal vigilance. This election is requiring that level of eternal vigilance. Um, we see in Texas where... Texas also has a strict voter ID law. Texas tried to close over 200 uh, uh, departments of motor vehicles where people could get their licenses. So with Texas trying to close over 200 of these, and they already had one-third of their counties without a department of motor vehicles when they passed um, SB 14, their voter ID law that was going to require people to make a 250 mile round trip to get a license that you don't drive. Um, this was massive voter suppression again, because it wasn't like they were offering a viable alternative. And remember, there is a close election happening in Texas right now um, that looks like it can unseat Senator, sitting Senator Ted Cruz. Um, and so, you're seeing all of these methods being deployed because the the republicans are almost uh, are almost like their population is about 90% white and their platform cannot speak to a broader diverse america um it could but they've made a choice for it not to and to speak in fact to the base um, and by speaking to the base, they have then become very repugnant to many Americans. Um, there was a recent poll where uh, millennials, um, African-American, Latino, and Asian-American uh, millennials, and white millennials um, all said that the Republican Party just did not address any of their concerns. Um, so... The response then is, how do you win these elections if our policies don't bring in the voters? And the way they're doing it is via voter suppression. Do you see this trend continuing? I see that they will fight um, tooth and nail for voter suppression. We, and, I, and, and I say that because... It would seem, for instance, that after a federal court says, mm, this has a discriminatory impact, that the state would go back going, oops, sorry, didn't mean that, and then draft a law that was clean. But that's not what Texas did. That's not what North Carolina did. That's not what Wisconsin did. Instead, they went back and tried to finesse it so that they could push it through again to have the same uh, disparate impact on uh, minority voters. And so, and having to go back to the court over and over and over and over. And so now, for instance, we're looking at North Carolina that um, the court has said, your gerrymandered districts are racially discriminatory. 
And North Carolina's response is, yeah, but it's too close to the election to redraw them, so why don't we just keep them? <laughs> um, and that is part of the way that this thing works. And so you imagine holding yet another election with racially discriminatory boundaries to create a racially discriminatory state legislature. So it's going to require our eternal vigilance. It's going to require that we vote. I mean, we have got to turn out and vote. Um, again, I look at those folks in Alabama where Alabama did everything possible to keep them from the polls. And they turned out in record numbers higher than the state average. That's what we're going to have to do if we're going to be able to then put in place um, policymakers who really value and believe in democracy and are trying to figure out how do we include more American citizens um, in this democracy than rather exclude them. Carol Anderson, her book is One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. Carol, I thank you so much for spending time with us today here on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.